All right. Today we're going to uh, start the material on the uh, first exam. The stuff is more biological in nature. Um, we're going to talk later on about more social factors, and we'll talk cognitive factors and stuff. But at first, you know, um, all children are born biological creatures with certain limitations. Um, we're going to be talking about um, nature and nurture, of course. Nature and nurture is our bigger question, and, and for the next few chapters, it's going to be some nature stuff. But uh, literally, the nature-nurture question, which we'll deal with in, in great detail as we go, but the nature-nurture question basically is a question of uh, how much of a child's personality, temperament, uh, intelligence, uh, whatever it might be, okay, it's hundreds of different things, how much of these factors are due to the way a child is born or what the child is born with, and how much is due to the environment that raised him. Now, again, um, we're going to talk about, you know, the contributions of nature and nurture, but the two are interacting. We're going to find it in both directions because it turns out, of course, that um, children that are born with certain biological predispositions, say some children are born um, with uh, relatively, well, I mean, with hormonal levels which... Um, make them desire uh, excitement or something. And so these, these kids that need a lot of excitement to get them going will choose environments which are exciting. And then the exciting environments will come back and modify the child. And in fact, we'll even touch on the, um, uh, the concept of epigenetics today, which is going to be the concept not just that a child's biology can influence which environments they end up in, but the environment that a child ends up in can in fact come back and change, literally change the biology that that child contains. So it's 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 a definitely a circular thing here, and we're going to discuss that. However, uh, um, we're going to be talking almost pure biology today so that you can get a handle on it. Because whether we believe it or not, um, Biology places limits on us. It's like a leash, okay? Biology is like a leash. It's like tying my dog to a tree, okay? Now, that dog is allowed to go left, right, up. I guess it could go up, down, right, whatever. Left, right, all over. Up north, south, east, west. But it can only go the length of its leash, okay? He's stuck on that leash. And that's kind of what biology does to us, is it... It gives us a limitation, a leash, an area that we could go into. Later on, the environment is going to determine where in that limited range, okay? Children, in fact, here's a really good example, uh, one of my favorites. Um, you know, I, I uh, go to a Korean church, and at this Korean church, they've got, uh, it's amazing, because after service, they always have um, lunch, full lunch, big lunch, and uh, they have these big extended families at the church. And it's really interesting because you've got grandmothers, parents, teenagers. And it's just crazy because um, this is three generations. It's not like, oh, things have changed. Guess what's changed? The food that they eat. Those teenagers that grow up here in America, they have milk, they have meat every single day. Their parents who grew up, in fact, I can talk. My wife, by the way, I don't know if I've mentioned it, but it's irrelevant to many things, is from Korea. She grew up in Korea. We met in New York. Um, but she said when she was growing up, um, they had meat, but it was like once a week or something like that. It was definitely not common. Milk was unheard of. They, they didn't have milk. Juice was pretty much not going to be happening. Um, you know, they, this is what she grew up. But she said her father was even um, in worse shape than her. She said her father, in fact, grew up in a situation where every day they, they had barley. They had barley and kimchi. That was their dinner, or their, their food every day. Now, I, I, what can I say except it, there's not very much nutrition in barley and kimchi. It's not going to make you talk. So my father-in-law, my well, my, mom, my wife's short too, but whatever. And then my kid, my kid already is 13 and he's almost taller than I am, okay? I don't know where this is going. But my kid grew up with way better stuff than I did. So what's the point? The point is, even these short little Korean and Asian women and men had the potential to be 
as tall as those teenagers are now, but they just were not given the opportunity in their environment. However, nature also does play a leash. Biology plays a leash. No matter how much milk and eggs and cheese and bread and blah, 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 you give to those kids, they're not going to be 47 feet tall. Okay? There is always going to be a limit. Biology places a limit, and the environment determines where in that range such a thing can happen. Okay? So the first thing I want to be uh, talking about is a little bit of um, evolution. And I know a lot of you don't believe in evolution. I want to talk a lot of evolution. But I want to lay it out for a particular reason. And that is simply because, uh, whether you believe it or not, I mean, we are biological creatures. And that biology that we have, which limits us, is in fact the result of inheritance. We inherited it from our parents. They inherited it from their parents. They inherited it from their parents. And onward and onward. And lo and behold, as we'll get to in, in the evolution, certain biological characteristics have allowed our ancestors to survive in the past, and certain have not. Certain have not allowed us to survive. Those biological characteristics that did not lead to survival and reproduction are gone. We are both biological creatures and that biology is the result of many generations of selective pressures. We'll get to it. So where do we come from? We all know some of these things, I'm sure. Creationism, the religious belief that humanity, life, and earth, and the universe was created by a supernatural being or beings, commonly a single deity. Of course, God we refer to. Catastrophism, a modified version in which blah, 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 you can read. The, the bottom one, though, that I want to be uh, talking about most, evolutionism believes that the slow changes in the average traits of a population of organisms from one generation to the next led to modern species. All right, well, we're going to talk about it. It's sort of a, it's a definition. Okay. So I'm going to talk very, very briefly about Darwin. I love Darwin. Be happy to know that I'm only going to talk briefly, okay? This guy, I could just, I could go on and on. Here's the deal. Pa uh, Darwin realized that populations change across time. It's a fact, okay? Um, it's, it's amazing, you know, if you dig, if you dig down into the fossil record and you find, it, well, you find the horses running around up here and then you dig in the ground 20 feet and you look at fossil horses, they're not the same as the horses that are up on top. And if you dig another 20 feet down, they're totally different again. But yet they're close enough that you can tell it's still a horse, okay? Equus or whatever that uh, generic, gen, you know, whatever. There's your Latin for you. So they do change, okay? And in fact, by that definition, evolution was the uh, evolution referred to the change in the average characteristics of a population with time. In this sense, um, evolution is a fact because I mean, look, you just you dig down and they're different. They are different. They change. They have changed with, in the past. They are changing in the present. However, we're going to come to the second second part of evolution, which is is in fact theory, and that is how does this change happen? Because the change does happen. Okay, you would have to deny every single piece of information that's looking. I mean, there is no controversy about this. It is just animals change. Yeah, take a look. I got a Shih Tzu, and there's a Great Dane, and they both came from a wolf. Uh, dude. Okay, animals change with time, but that question of how they change is a whole different question. All right. So now, uh, Darwin. In fact, Darwin grew up in, a, in an interesting world. There's a little side note, but um, Darwin had problems with, with his theory, and one of his biggest problems was that his wife was a very, very religious lady, and he loved his wife very, very much. And so even when he found all of these facts that were pointing to certain things, he was very hesitant to publish anything simply because he did not want to hurt his wife. Okay? That's kind of an interesting side effect. Um, but uh, here's the deal. There will always be more organisms. Um, this is Thomas Malthus. His concept of um, Thomas Malthus's concept, whereby uh, populations tend to increase geometric. Wait a minute. Populations tend to in, okay. Food supply increases arithmetically. Populations tend to increase geometrically. What's going to happen is there is always going to be situations where animals will outstrip their food sources. Um, especially in times of drought or famine in particular, but I mean all the time. So we'll uh, take that simple example of um, the old giraffes in Africa. There's a bunch of giraffes and everybody's happy and there's lots of food and la da 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 da. And along comes a drought. And all of a sudden there's not enough food 
for the number of giraffes. So what is the inevitable result when there's not enough food? Somebody is going to die. And that's what evolution comes from. Somebody is going to die. Who is going to die? Who is going to live? That's what evolution is all about. Okay? Um, a couple of things he knew. By the way, I don't want to really get into this a lot because this is a uh, child site, but offspring tend to resemble their parents. We'll get into genetics later in this chapter. Darwin didn't know genetics, but he did know the simple fact that babies tend to look like mamas. He just didn't have any idea why. Okay? So that's a fact. Okay? Um, I want to show you the simple one. Okay? Here's the deal. You dig down into the fossil record, and you pull out all these fossilized giraffes. And you know what you're going to find? You're going to find some variability. You're going to find this is a... In this case, this is the length of a giraffe's neck. I don't know how long a giraffe's neck is. Let's say it's three feet. In the fossil record, the average giraffe length, neck length is three feet. However, of those fossils, some are two feet, some are one feet, some are four feet, some are five feet. However, those giraffes with five foot necks in the fossil record are actually quite rare. Okay? This is frequency or how many you find. The most common giraffe length neck bleh, is three feet. However, if you look at modern giraffes, what you find is that the average neck length is 8 feet, something like this. I don't know, I'm making these up. 8 feet. Some modern giraffes have a 7-foot neck. Some modern giraffes have a 6-foot neck. Some modern giraffes have a 9-foot neck. Some have a 10-foot neck. However, the average is 8 feet with this variability. So here is a fact. This is evolution as a statement. This is what a fossil giraffe looks like. The average fossil giraffe or the spread of fossil giraffes. Here is the average modern giraffe and the spread of modern giraffes. They are different. The average characteristic, the average characteristic was three, the average characteristic is now eight. The average characteristic of the species has in fact changed across time. Evolution as a fact right here. Evolution as a theory, however, is a question of how come? Why is that possible? What is it that made it move from here to here? Okay. We're going to have a, some brief discussion on that. Brief, because again, this is child sight class. Um, I'm going to leave it alone. It's a silly, uh, silly, but perhaps actually correct. We'll leave that alone. Charles Lyles. No shit. All right, here's, here's the one that we can describe. Okay. Um, here's a very true, interesting story. This is a gypsy moth. Okay. This is what gypsy moths used to look like. Just like with the giraffe's length of neck, the color of a gypsy moth also has variability. Some gypsy moths are very dark. Some gypsy moths are very light colored. And in fact, I'm going to have to draw it. So just bear with me, and I'll see if I can get it up. Okay? Let's say here's an, an example. Okay? And this is darkness. Instead of length of giraffe's neck, like it was on the last one, this is the darkness of a gypsy moth. This is really light, really dark. And it turns out that gypsy moths, before the Industrial Revolution, this was the average gypsy moth. Okay? A little bit, you know, over in here. What happened was that um, if a gypsy moth, see, it turned out that uh, that whole principle of camouflage you may have heard in some other situations. And what happens is if a gypsy moth is too dark, then it sticks out when it lands on a tree and the birds eat it. If it's too light, then its color sticks out on a tree and the birds eat it. This is a color which matched the bark of the tree. This is a color that allowed the gypsy moths to blend in. Then. Along came the Industrial Revolution, and they burned all kinds of coal, and the, uh, the trunks of the trees got real dark, and all of a sudden, these gypsy moths with this color, which used to be the good color, stuck out because the tree trunks were now real dark in color. And so these stuck out, and the birds ate them. But guess what? All of a sudden, these moths, which earlier didn't really have any, I mean, this, this is a bad color to be to begin with, right? This is a bad color. But once the tree trunks got dark, that started to become a better color, didn't it? Because you could, you could blend in better. And lo and behold, during the Industrial Revolution, the average gypsy moth was this color, much darker. 
Okay. What happened now is these that used to be a bad thing now became a good thing. La dee da, and then they cleaned up their shit over in Britain, and the trees got back to that normal color. And guess what happened? All of a sudden, being dark is a bad thing again. And this one, which was somewhat bad a little while ago, is now good again because the environment makes this determination. Now, what's the key to this? Here was the average. It shifted over. When the environment changed, it shifted over in response to the environmental change. When the environment changed back to what it was to begin with, it shifted back. Okay? I want to note right behind here, I know there's this misconception that evolution is in some way some movement towards perfection or something. That's a total misconception, but many people have it. So what we need to know is that the motivation behind evolution, that's a little crooked now, eh, you can deal with it. The motivation behind evolution is not perfection, but in fact survival. Okay? Survival in the current, in the current environment. As the environment changes, the most adaptive responses changed or in situations. Okay? So those that genes best suited to an environment are likely to survive and reproduce. The motivation is survival, not uh, not perfection. And so we could talk about the same thing with the length of a giraffe's neck. Those with longer necks could reach higher you got some uh, drought. Oh, God, I'm hungry. And short giraffes, they're screwed. Tall giraffes, they got, first they eat the low food, then they eat the high food. Bully for you, buddy. Um, and so we could talk about this concept of natural selection. Um, I don't want to mention mutations. We're going to get mutations when I talk genetics in a little while, so I'm not going to really get into that. But suffice it to say, though, that natural selection seems to be a major, if not the major, selective pressure or explanation, rather, explanation for why animals change with time is not the only one. One of my favorites, chicks dig it. Okay? Sexual selection. Turns out that uh, sometimes it's not the environment that determines who lives and who dies. Often, what it is, is women make decisions about what kind of man they want to make babies with, okay? And so, lo and behold, you got yourself a peacock, that stupid peacock from a, from a uh, natural selection perspective. Look at these great big feathers. Woo! From a natural selection perspective, here's a fact. He lives in the forest in India. This dude is trying to get away from, I don't know what, a tiger, I guess, right? You got a tiger. He's screwed. The bigger his tail, the more screwed he is. So how is it possible that natural selection would allow such a massive display? And the answer is because chicks dig it. And if this little peahen says, oh baby, oh baby, I like it, is more likely to choose this one, then what happens is, of course, the babies that they have will also be prone to, remember we said babies tend to resemble mom and dad, the babies will also tend to have great big huge plume and foliage, and this type of selection is going to lead to changes in the average characteristics across time. Artificial selection is something like natural selection, but we, we humans, make those selections. And I mean, this is... This is um, this is a little different. This is more in agriculture than anything. I'll let it go. Suffice it to say that natural selection is the biggest one. These are also selective things. Fact is, animals change with time. Why? Natural selection, artificial selection, sexual selection. Lots of reasons that they change with time. Evolution as a fact. Animals change. Evolution as a theory. Why do they change? Here's three answers. There are others out there. These are just major ones of them. Now, I know. This is child sight class. How does this have anything to do with child sight? Well, it turns out that we are an interesting lot. We as humans are biologically designed. I mean, evolution has selected for certain things. And by the way, not that class, but I want you to know this. 
that ev evolution can not just select for biological characteristics, but it can also select for behavioral traits. Okay, it turns out that uh, I mean boys are more aggressive than girls, and we could go yada 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 because it's like this. You got yourself. Just imagine a scenario where you got a deserted island with one woman and two men. <laughs> Who gets the girl, okay? The bigger, more aggressive boy always wins. And so we find that the physical behavioral traits, such as aggression, have been selected in males in such a way that it... And so we are designed, we are biologically programmed Evolution is selected for behaviors and biological characteristics for a world that no longer exists. This is very interesting. In the modern world, aggression is not, not a, a highly desired characteristic for males to display. Uh, they do, don't get me wrong. I mean, they do, but boy, oh boy. Uh, and then, again, it's not this class, but suffice it to say there we can talk about Cultural evolution and biological evolution. Cultural evolution is running a mile a minute. I mean, cultural evolution is flashing. I mean, things from a hundred years ago are unrecognizable to us. Yet, biological, we're the exact same creature being placed into this culturally completely different world. And so, we were biologically programmed to be cave dudes, but we're placed up in the modern world. We have to act all civilized and shit. Well. Guess what? Those little boys, and we're going to talk about little boys and little girls. This stuff does influence the way they behave, yet we throw them into a modern classroom and say, sorry, ignore your biology and ignore everything that evolution has placed inside of you and instead sit there and listen to your teacher. All right, we'll talk about it. Hi there. I'm just recording the class. All right. So here it comes straight out of the, um, this is actually word for word out of the textbook. I liked it, but I copied it out. Each one of us began as a single cell, a fertilized egg cell. By the time we reach adulthood, that cell has multiplied into several trillion cells. The structure and function of every cell in the body is governed by genes, molecules that dictate how our cells develop. We're going we're gonna to lay this out, but it was a good start. We inherit some of these genes from our mother and some from our father. But the specific combination of genes that governs our cells is unique to each of us and distinguishes us from other living things as well as all other human beings. Okay? It's a good, a good line. I guess it wasn't as good as I remembered it being when I wrote it down, but whatever. Let's pull it apart. You have a lot of cells in your body, many, 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 many cells. In many ways, the cells are the same. Of course, they're different, but they have the same genetic baggage in each and every one. Each human cell has 46 chromosomes, which operate in 23 pairs. There are 23 pairs. Of those 22 pairs, okay, so chromosomes are the bigger ones. There's 46 of them. We're going to break it down. Chromosomes are bigger, and then they're composed of genes, and genes are composed of DNA, and DNA is actually deoxyribonucleic acids, and Gs and Ns, and blah, blah, blahs. There are 22 pairs that match. Males and females have similar ones, but that 23rd pair is a little bit different. Boys look like this, girls look like that. What a surprise, we're different, okay? And on the 23rd pair, and we'll talk about gender in great detail later on, suffice it to say, if the 23rd pair of chromosomes has an X and an X shape, then you, my dear, are probably a little girl. If on that 23rd pair we have one as an X and one as a Y, the Y, don't even, I'm not going to the MCA right now. If one is an X and one is a Y, chances are you are a boy, okay? Later on we're going to get into that whole question, what does it mean to be a girl and what does it mean to be a boy? And though XX and XY on your 23rd chromosome, pair of chromosomes, is a major, major component of what it means to be a boy and what it means to be a girl. It is by no means the only thing. Okay? Turns out that that DNA, that uh, chromosome rather, is composed of DNA. It's huge. I mean, there are, I don't know, billions. There's so many pieces of DNA on each chromosome. And that DNA is clustered together. And I don't know, let's say this 50 pieces of DNA work together 
and we call those 50 pieces of DNA which work together a gene. A gene is simply a segment of chromosome. Here's a chromosome, there's a billion pieces of DNA on it. Well, it turns out that these 50 pieces of DNA tend to work together to perform a job, and we call it a gene. A gene is a segment, an area on the chromosome composed of multiple pieces of DNA which act together to perform a particular job. Okay? Now, there are approximately 20 to 30,000 genes inside of us. Now, uh, contrary to popular belief, genes are never simple. Um, we're going to get to some really cool stuff, you know, like uh, making a chicken with teeth and shit like this. It's going to be cool. But it uh, turns out that genes are never simple. There is rarely going to be a situation where, well, the gene, this one says, and we'll talk Mendel, Mendel's, you know, I'm, we're not going to talk Mendel's genetics, but maybe you vaguely recall Mendel's genetics, and it was like, Yellow peas and green peas, and blah, 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 blah. we'll do the eyes and stuff. But you know, but it's rarely, rarely that simple. Usually, one gene will code lots of different stuff, because twenty to thirty thousand seems like a lot. But when you think about you, you have more than twenty to thirty thousand physical characteristics. Now, if you get into psychological characteristics and behavioral tendencies and traits and personalities and temperaments, the number explodes. So clearly there is very rarely going to be one gene leads to one thing. That's just not how it's going to work, unfortunately. Eh, here's an old picture, whatever. Um, nothing I really care too much about because it's not genetics class per se. We just got to get the gist of it. I don't know, read it if you want. The genome, the genome is simply um, the... The, your genome would be those 20 to 30,000 genes that code who you are, okay? So we could map your genome, map your genome and literally lay out that 20 to 30,000 genes and in some way go, here is a map of who you are, just like, you know, here is a map of the city of Fort Worth and it represents, uh, you know, the bigger city, you could have a genomic map, whatever it's for. The Human Genome Project is a multinational effort by governments and scientists to map the 3 billion pairs of nucleotide bases and the 20 to 30,000 genes contained. Um, it's interesting, okay, without getting into um, a lot. We'll get into some controversies later, I'm sure. But for now, just kind of, this sounds like, oh my God, so much science, woo, woo, woo. but it's just, this is real stuff for child sight. Because nowadays, you know, um, I can still remember this one friend, uh, friend of my family. They were pregnant four or five months, something like that. Um, they had a high-risk pregnancy, so we're going to talk about some of their tests. But they, they did a test on them. They pulled it out, and they said, whoa, dude, there's a 58% chance that this baby's going to be born with Down syndrome. Again, we'll talk about Down syndrome. And so how did they do it? Genome work. And then, of course, the next question becomes, do you want to keep it or do you want to try again, right? That, that, that's what, what the question becomes. Now, let's say we can, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a little science fiction-y here, I'll admit it. But now imagine we can map it out and we can say, okay, we estimate that this child, I know it's not born yet, but we estimate that this child is going to have an IQ score between 97 and 103. We estimate that this child, given perfect uh, nutrition, will be 4 foot 7. We estimate that this child will be, imagine how all these different things that we could do, uh, including diseases, of course, too, but also predispositions. And uh, imagine the whole scenario, because then, of course, as as we said, the question becomes, do you want to keep it? Or do you think you could do better next time, you know? And so it's a dangerous business and a dangerous world. No, no, no. What does that say? Finding specific genes and discovering their functions is a hugely complicated test. Yeah, of course it is. Because as we said, there is no, I mean, there's a couple. But I mean, rarely is it like one gene, one thing, okay? One gene might primarily be here, but it also influences other traits. <laughs> okay, so you can't, it, it's not, it's not like, well, we could like make a gene that's perfect, right? Because of course, if you make this good, this, all kinds of funky shit. 
All right, here's a really cool one. I put this up on Blackboard. I made sure it was up there this morning. This article is called um, Why Your DNA Isn't Your Destiny. And it was a fascinating um, article. I'll give you a little, very, very brief about it. Um, there's this epidemiologist in Sweden, and he goes to the birth records in Sweden in this little remote village. And this village was so remote. I mean, they were self-sustaining. Um, if they grew a good harvest, they ate well. If their harvest sucked, they went hungry. Okay. So what he did was he tracked the birth and death rates and stuff of multiple generations in this, this village, and he tracked them down since 1820. I, I guess the Swedes keep pretty good records. And so what he found was that if boys suffered when they were kids, you know, there was a bad harvest, they were, oh, I'm so hungry, shit, okay? Now, you take those boys, and we can dig it. We can say, your environment influences what happens to you. Yeah, sure, we can talk about health consequences for that boy or life expectancy for that boy. Is that, we're, we're not going to. I mean, that, that would be a different question. <laughs> What's interesting now, that boy turns into a man. He has himself some children. Is it possible that what happened to that, that little kid over there, whether or not he got, went hungry or not, will influence his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren? Yeah, lo and behold, if this kid went hungry in 1817, then it turns out that his great-grandchildren lived significantly longer than if this kid who was born in 1824 when there was lots of food. So if a kid ate lots of food, their great-grandchildren died sooner than if their great-grandfather, uh, whatever, a lot of generations. You get the drill. And this is something called the epigenome. The epigenome is a relatively, relatively recent phenomenon to be discussed. It's, it's been in the scientific community for, thir for 35, 40 years, but only recently has it really escaped the lab into more mainstream uh, places. And we find that on top of our gene is something called the epigene, the epigenome, uh, the epigene, and the epigene is very, very cool. It's like a little, it's a, keep, to keep it simple, it's like a set of switches along the top of the gene that is sort of like an on and an off, okay? So you can have all kinds of genetic potential inside of you, but the epigenome is literally the switches that say whether or not to turn that thing on or to turn that thing off. Just because you have the potential doesn't mean it's going to be fulfilled. You may have the potential for developing some funky, weird-ass type of cancer. Will it develop? may well be a result of the epigenome and the epigenome may switch on or may switch stay switched off and that may in fact be the result of the environmental consequences and chemicals and blah 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 blah, blah in your environment so it's really really a, a very cool idea it is a very very cool concept how this works but what it comes down to and unfortunately there's a truth to this if you are you are naughty and you do naughty stuff when you are uh, 20 years old, something like that, what's going to happen? It's going to mess you up, right? But guess what? It also screws with your epigenome. And your epigenome then gets passed to your children. So the old... Uh, I just, I didn't inhale, is, is it gonna, is it, ah, oh, shit, it could, okay? Now, don't get me wrong, we gotta live, but uh, if you do particularly bad stuff, it not only influences whether you live or die, but it also influences whether your children live or die. It's kind of a funky thing. I mean, the children haven't even been born yet, and that's some weird stuff, man. Uh, wow, that's a lot of words. I mean, if you understand it, good for you. There you go. So now let's talk very briefly, because the next chapter is really about um, reproduction. But we're going to talk a little bit about cells. Okay. Um, turns out that uh, there are two basic types of cells. As we said, almost every cell in your body has 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs, 22 match, one dozen. Almost every cell has the same genetic composition with some cells, and this is where epigenetics is important. Some cells, let's say the cell in the tip of your finger has the same 
same genetic programming as the cell in your earlobe. I don't know, the cochlea of your ear or some shit. It's the same genetic material, but the epigenome decides which aspects of that cell will be turned on or will be turned off. Yet they're all the same. Got it? Off, on, off, off, on, off, off, off. Okay, so. All right, so I got, got lost. Turns out that there is a special type of cell called the gamete. Okay? Very special, very few of them, very rare. We tend to refer to them as egg and sperm, right? Now, these gametes, which are special cells, have only 23 total chromosomes. Instead of 23 pairs, it has 23 individuals. The 23 individuals from dad, 23 individuals from mom, bada bing, da and you got 46. Wait a minute, I didn't know what you were supposed to have 46? Yep, that's how it works. Here's a couple of words for us. An allele is a version of a gene. Turns out that a version of a gene, one version of the gene might be green peas, and one version of the gene might be yellow peas. All right, there's Gregor Mendel for you. Um, uh, zygote, no, we're gonna we're gonna leave that for the next chapter. Uh, mitosis. Um, Turns out mitosis is simply cell division. Again, I, I, I want to save this for the next chapter because we're going to talk about this in great detail there. But suffice it to say, um, your, your body is constantly creating new cells through mitosis. The original cell split, boom, mitosis, and the, the, the new one is exactly the same as where it came from. Uh, meiosis is that cell division that creates the gametes, the sperm, and the egg, where you take the 46 and go, bing! 23, 23, just 23. Uh, monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins, that's a fancy name for identical twins and fraternal twins. Um, identical twins come when uh, a single egg and a single sperm mat meet each other, and after the fertilization has occurred, they split into two separate growing organisms. Dizygotic twins, there are two eggs and there are two sperm, and they are separate from each other. And it turns out that a monozygotic twin, by definition, is a clone, right? Because it is a single one cell, which then pops in half. And dizygotic twins are no more similar than any brother or sister. We'll talk about these when we talk about some inheritance stuff. And the sex goes Okay. No. No. Boring, boring, boring. Human reproduction, whatever. Children conceived by artificial insemination and in vitro fertilization do not have any particular developmental problems. That sounds like an exam question for some reason. Shut down there. Uh, blah, 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 blah. No, no. Leave that. Leave that. I think we got enough for now because, especially because, like I said, we're going to have. Oh, um, uh, we're going to do. They develop a uh, physical. Fertilization, baby, pregnancy, whatever. Uh, monozygotic, we already said it. Uh, they're exactly the same. They must be, by definition, the same gender. Um, and it seems to be about one out of every 260. There doesn't seem to be anything inherited about it. They just are. Um, however, fraternal twins, there seems to be a strong inheritance factor that runs in families. Um, if the mother side has a lot of twins, then the mother is more likely to have twins in, in the dizygotic sense. We find, in fact, ethnic differences. Um, only one in 500 Asian births are dizygotic twins, one in 125 Caucasian births, and different populations, but as high as one in 20 for African populations. So clearly there is a, um, an inherited characteristic here. Uh, uh, I, I want to talk briefly here. Uh, it turns out, as we said, an allele is a potential, a, a, a version of a gene. A version of a gene is an allele. And uh, since you're going to get one allele, one version of the gene from your mom, remember your chromosomes, 23 pairs, are matched. And so there's going to be a chunk of gene on this, I don't know, chromosome 14. So you take chromosome 14, the one that mom gave you, and here's a gene. Chromosome 14, the one that dad gave you, and here's a gene. Bing! And they're going to be a little different from each other, aren't they? 
These are called alleles, right? They're both the same gene. They both are for the same thing, but they're going to be different versions, okay? And so we find that of these versions, some versions are what we call dominant versions, and some are what we call recessive versions. Dominant versions win if you have two versions that don't match, and one is dominant, one is recessive, the dominant is what you're going to look like. That is how it's going to express itself. Okay? Let me show you the, I think I have this example up in here, right? Yeah, good. There are two versions, and we're going to keep it simple. This Again, the world is not this simple. Here's a gene for eye color from mom and a gene for eye color from dad. There are, let's just pretend two different possible ways that it could look, brown or blue. Well, it turns out that brown is what we call a dominant allele, and blue is what we call a recessive allele. And so if mom gave you a brown allele and dad gave you a blue allele, that baby is going to have brown eyes, period. If mom gave a brown and dad gave a brown, they're both dominant, bam, baby's got a brown eyes. If mama gave a blue and daddy also gave a blue, and only in that scenario will the baby have a blue eyes, okay? Now... This is kind of silly because, as I said, my wife is Asian and she wanted to have blue-eyed children. And I'm like, uh, I'm trying to convince her it isn't going to happen, you know. Um, she just wasn't going for it. So it turns out that in the Asian population, they just don't have blue-eyed people. So my wife was giving to my baby a brown allele. I, with blue eyes, by definition, must have two blue alleles inside of me. Therefore, I must have given my baby a blue my children must have two alleles, one brown, one blue. That is what they are carrying. However, my children will express only the brown eyes because that is a dominant color, right? That is a dominant allele, rather. Will I have blue-eyed grandchildren? Possibly. It is possible because both of my children, as a fact, are carrying a blue-eyed allele inside of them, which will never be expressed in them because of the dominant brown which was given to them by their mother, but it's that little genetic baggage that's hanging along just waiting to be passed along to the next generation. Okay? There are some dominant gene diseases like Huntington's, Huntington's disease, and um, it's, it's similar. I mean, it's, it's, obvious. it's got the same kind of a concept as the brown eyes. If you have a single allele for Huntington's disease, you will have Huntington's disease. And so we could look at these, uh, by the way, these are Punnett squares, take the bio class. We could look at these Punnett squares and we could tell the exact same story as the eye color, but we won't. Um, recessive gene diseases. That a recessive gene disease is sort of, sort of like, again, take the same story, but now imagine instead of talking about the brown eye dominant, we talk about the blue eyed recessive. As certain diseases such as cystic fibrosis, an infant must have both the cystic fibrosis, yes, allele from mom and from dad, in order to express cystic fibrosis. The, the cystic fibrosis. So we have scenarios where, you know, given this setup, you know, you could have a scenario where neither mom nor dad has cystic fibrosis, but the baby does. Oh, shit. Or a scenario where both mom and dad have cystic fibrosis, but the baby does not. Okay? Well, it turns out, of course, that what we're carrying as our genetic baggage and what gets expressed are not always matching each other. And in this recessive case, it's, it's just a little different. I, there are lots of them. Certain characteristics. It's not just the, brown, the dominant versus recessive. But on that 23rd pair of chromosomes, if you recall, if you have an X and you have an X, then you're a girl. Gotcha? And so therefore, for girls, all of these rules of dominant and recessive, they remain true because uh, it turns out that uh, your 23rd pair, ladies, is exactly the same. I mean, it functions in the same relationship as the other 22. But as boys, we got a little bit different because on that last pair, we got an X and we got no second X. So if mama gives us a funky allele on our X, we ain't got no other second X to wipe it out. Okay? So there's certain things that us boys get, like bald, 
And why has that happened? Because bald comes straight from mama. Mama gives you bald, which is ironic because mamas are rarely bald. And so the baldness allele, if it comes on that X from mama, there ain't no other X from daddy to, to knock it out. And so us boys, we tend to get it. Girls can. Girls can be bald. But the only way is if they get the baldness allele on both X's. If it pops up on both X's, women will be bald. That's a pretty big rarity. The odds of getting it on a single X are quite high. Quite high. The odds of getting it on both X's is actually quite low. Uh, color blindness, yeah, that's us boys too. No, 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 no. Chromosome abnormalities. Well, it turns out, and, and again, we're going to talk more about pregnancy and birth and stuff. But it turns out that uh, there's. You know, we talked about mutations so very briefly. Um, chromosome abnormalities. Well, it turns out that as a fetus, as a baby is developing, by far the majority of time, when something weird, some shit, weird shit is going on, mommy's bodies reject babies. Chromosome abnormalities. The majority of chromosomal abnormalities never get born. Okay, it results in a miscarriage. Um, nature weeds it out and says this is something that shouldn't have been happen. Okay? There are a few that get through the process, let's say for example um, Down syndrome, where there's an extra 21st chromosome. So instead of having 22 pairs, you had the 21 pairs and then one is in fact three. Yeah, whatever, weird stuff. There's some others um, we'll talk about in a little bit at some point, like Kleinfelter syndrome or Turner syndrome, where they have like just a single X or XYY. I think Kleinfelter syndrome was XYY. Turner syndrome was just a single X if memory serves. So there's different, you know, there are some exceptions, but by far the majority of chromosomal abnormalities never get born. Just don't have it. Uh, Down syndrome. There's a relationship between age and Down syndrome, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, that's some scary stuff. There it is. You got three, three, uh, trisomy 21, three, three, uh, chromosomes at the 21st point. Um, uh, I don't have that. Okay. Prenatal screening. Um, some of you perhaps have had babies and have done ultrasounds. They're fairly routine at this point. Um, I mean, even before the ultrasound, they take a, um, fetal heartbeat. Right? Boom, 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 boom. Anybody do that? I don't know. Apparently, they stick really cold stuff for the moment's value. I don't know. It didn't look cold. So you take all that stuff on there and you listen to the heartbeat. You're like, oh, that's the baby. All right, whatever. Uh, later on, they might give you an ultrasound and they'll actually take a picture. <laughs> look at it. Um, I'll show you some of those images later. I have some ultrasound images up somewhere. Um, However, if somebody's in a high-risk pregnancy, these are fairly routine, but if somebody's in a high-risk pregnancy, we make, uh, doctors may say, hey, it, we need to know certain things ahead of time. Let's do an amniocentesis or a CVS. These two are much more invasive procedures and um, have a, I don't remember the numbers, but it's about a 1% probability of inducing a miscarriage as a result of Therefore, these are reserved for situations where the need to know outweighs the risks involved. Okay? So these are definitely not routine by any means, but using amniocentesis and, and, amniocentesis and CVS, you can get a lot more detailed information about the genetic makeup of this infant as it's developing. Oh, that's creepy. Ugh. Look at this. Uh, genotype, phenotype, here's some good words. I think you know these from your genetics class, your genetics, your biology class, right? Uh, blah, 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 no, 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 whatever, G by E, I don't know. Um, anyway, a genotype is like the, the, uh, the alleles that you have inside of you. Remember I said my children have a brown allele and a blue allele. That would be reference to their genotype. Their phenotype would be the fact that they actually physically have brown eyes, how those things express themselves. Um, we'll get to some of these things here. Uh, 
the range of reaction. As we said, this is this is uh, kind of um, related to that notion. Uh, that, as I said, the 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 the, the, the Korean teenagers I was referring to that those little monsters and that was because they have all the food. Well, as I also said, that uh, no matter how much food you give these kids, they're never going to be 47 feet tall. That's kind of what this is referring to, right? This concept that um, nature puts a leash on what the environment can do. Um, uh, you know what? I just I need to move on. I, it looks like a genius picture, but every time I think about it, it, it makes less and less sense. Niche picking is a tendency. This is this is again. I mean, I sort of hinted at this. Now, I mean, I talked about it in the very opening slide. But here we're just sort of putting a uh, a name to what we had already talked about. Niche picking is a tendency to pick activities, environments that will fit with our genetic predispositions. If a kid was born with a genetic predisposition for I like excitement, I like to have stimulation, they will pick environments, including things such as parachuting or depending on how things work. Um, if, if a child is born with a need for excitement and they grow up in a bad neighborhood, maybe they'll join a gang. If they grow up in a, with this need for excitement and they grow up in an overprivileged family, then they'll be able to afford skydiving or something. So, I mean, it's, it's niche picking is sort of like finding those environments, but only those that we can, right? Because there's going to be limits to it. Um, and lo and behold, um, it's kind of interesting because not only do children pick their niche, but they also influence that group, and they themselves then change that environment. That environment comes back and changes them. Um, it's interesting stuff, but it's just they're just taking the concept of nature nurture and just sort of probabilistic epigenetic the likelihood that specific environmental conditions will activate specific genes that lead to particular traits or behavioral outcomes. As I said, um, the epigenome is the thing that lies on top of the gene genome. Um, each and every uh, cell in our body, well, generically anyway, each and every cell in our body has the same potential, but clearly the, the cells in my finger are not the same as the cells in my nose. And uh, why is that? Because the epigenome says on, off, on, off. And those on, off switches, though some of it is, of course, programmed from birth, some of those switches are, in fact, determined by the environmental experiences you have. Okay? And that's really what this is. I mean, this is just a different way of saying what I had talked about earlier. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, we said all of this. Uh, okay, behavioral genetics, very briefly. Behavioral genetics is a study of how genetic and environmental factors relate to behavioral differences among people. Uh, it talks about the concept of heritability. Heritability as a, a, a word, a mathematical estimate of the degree of genetic influence for a given trait or behavior. Okay. So we're going to ask this question, I know they're going to call it G by E or whatever, we're going to, we're going to stick to nature nurture because we're still psychologists. And we're going to say, hey, this kid, you know, he's, um, oh, in fact, you know what, I got, uh, I heard it on the radio, nah, maybe I shouldn't talk about it on the radio, but whatever. Uh, I would say a kid is a mathematical genius, and, or, or I don't want to say that, but, a kid is a genius at school, and you go, okay, why is a kid a genius? Is it because he was born that way in nature, or is it because of the environment he was raised in nurture? And of course, and the answer to every one of these, every time you ask this question, the answer is going to be both, right? It's going to be both. Okay, well, I got it. It's not, it's not nature or nurture, it's a combination of both. But the question is, how much nature? Now, we could answer, you know, we could ask how much nurture, but we don't. We ask how much nature, and we use the word heritability. And therefore, when we answer the question, how much nature, we're hinting at the other side of the question, how much nurture, how much of it is a result of. And so we find that certain things have high heritability and certain things have low heritability. Okay? And it's kind of crazy because, unfortunately, these heritability numbers are a heck of a lot higher than you might imagine. And in fact, the more you study these heritability numbers, the more depressing the concept of adoption becomes because you find... Um, so much of what a baby is, so much of what a baby will become is a result of egg, meat, sperm, the story is already written. 
Great. We talked about niche picking. We talked about canalization. We talked about probabilistic epigenetics. We talked about all right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. But the main story has been written when it comes from, and it's kind of a crazy thing. Okay. Heritability estimations can range from zero to one. Okay. In other words, this is a percentage from zero percent to one percent or one hundred percent. Zero percent means that um, the uh, uh, Nature plays no role at all. 100% or 1.0 would mean that nature is completely responsible for it. Now, clearly, there's nothing that falls at these two extremes. Almost everything, when you ask heritability, is a question of where in the middle does it lie. Um, yeah. All right, so how do you estimate heritability, twin studies and stuff? Thomas Bouchard, and uh, somewhere around 1982 or something, uh, discovered that there was a set of twins, <clears throat> identical twins, that had been born and put up for adoption and then raised into different homes. And it was like, okay, dude, this is awesome. We've got a scenario where, um, as we said, identical twins are clones, are genetic clones. They have the exact same genetic material. Nature is exactly the same. Now they're raised in different houses. So we can study the effects of nature versus nurture. Unfortunately, these studies were flawed for a lot of reasons, but number one, because there is no, no uh, epigenetics being considered in these stories, but that's another one. We could also look at adoption studies and say, hey, oh, this kid was adopted when they were born, and now they're 18 years old, and who do they look like? That mom and dad that raised them for the last 18 years, or those two people in Eggman's firm that they never interacted with. Okay, and of course, you know each, each you know different characteristic, your type of personality or intelligence or whatever. I mean, they're all they're all a little different. But as I said, it's a little bit depressing because it, it's so much nature. Put them all together, but of course, things such as uh, problems are like in an adoption study that. Um, Adoption centers tend to have selection criterion, which fairly well ensure that even though these identical twins are reared apart, they're reared in homes that are very similar to each other. Um, they're, they're, you know, the, the adoption agencies don't allow certain families and stuff, so they ensure that they're pretty much the same. Uh, so here's just a couple of complex characters. We'll, we'll come back to the nature and nurture as we go, but just a couple that. Um, heredity has a significant influence on an IQ score with as high as 0.5. Okay, again, you know, so a baby's born, and is, boy, is the baby going to be smart? What should you look at? The house that they grow up in, in an adoption study, or mom and dad's intelligence? And it's the egg meat sperm, mom and dad, that are in many ways more important than the house they grow up in. Um, similar findings for other specific cognitive skills such as spatial reasoning or verbal reasoning or perceptual speed. So if you look at IQ as a whole or as individual components. Um, other achievement scores like English usage, mathematics, social studies, natural sciences. Again, if you want to predict, you know, an adopted child, if you want to predict what their scores are going to be in college, look at the, the not the parents that raised them, but the parents that egg meat sperm and they never met. Uh, here's a whole bunch of them, and it's kind of an interesting thing here. Not only here, not only does it get into um, cognitive skills with uh, some of these things such as divergent thinking, which is like creative or critical thinking or something, or creativity or something, uh, becoming less heritable, much less heritable than more general scores are. But we also find things like personality, including Proneness to anxiety, okay? And it's like, is this kid going to be anxious when he's older? Uh, depends. Did that biological parents, were they anxious? Yes or no? It's not the environment they grew up in. Point seven, that's a huge heritability factor. Uh, conservatism? Oh my god, you can inherit conservatism? You can inherit hyperactivity, schizophrenia or risk for, obesity, all kinds of funky stuff. Uh, yeah, you know what? No, I think I'm, what, what does that say? Heritability estimates for cognitive skills increase with age. Ooh, that's impressive. 
Uh, therefore, genetic influence is very strong in these things. So, um, heritability for personality and temperament can go as high as 0.7. I mean, clearly what gets inherited. And this goes back now because I know you're like, I don't believe in evolution. Well, guess what, okay? We talked about uh, evolution not only influenced us biologically, but it also influenced characteristics of us, behavioral characteristics of us that allowed our ancestors to survive. And we are carrying that genetic baggage with us and we're passing it along to our children, whether we want to believe it or not. So we're going to stop here, and in the next chapter, we're going to pick up and talk about the, um, the actual act of egg meat sperm, and the baby develops, and the baby's born, and yay, we got a new baby.